mahalo. In fact, all of us owe a debt of gratitude to a very special group of people this morning. It's Kauai Bible College. Can you guys all stand? Staff and students. Wait, wait. What do you, you don't even know what you're clapping for yet. No, no, you guys stand up. Okay, they're, they're, they're so hopeful. They're clapping already. They just love you guys. It doesn't matter. Okay, one, one quick thing. We have a new student, Shay. Where are you, Shay? She's right over here. Oh, Shay, you got to stand up. Is she? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You were behind some, some other people. I didn't see you there. Sorry about that. Okay, so Shay's over there. So make sure you get to know her. But I have to tell you that on Thursday, uh, we had a board meeting, and, uh, and Hurricane Lester was bearing down on us, and it looked pretty certain we were going to get hit. So we put plans into place uh, to completely evacuate this tent and our facilities here, put everything down. Uh, we hired a crew from, uh, from a local company, a tent company, to assist us in that project. The Bible College came in shortly after that, and they completely stripped this place bare. I didn't know how badly they'd stripped this place bare. Uh, I was, Becky and I have discipleship on, we were discipling a number of leaders on Thursday nights. I came back the next morning, and this place was like naked. There wasn't anything here. They took the lights, they took everything, it was gone. And then we realized on Friday morning that Lester had you know, taken a, a turn to the north and was weakening. And so we, we did an about face, and now we had to put the whole place back together. So this Bible college that took everything out of this facility and our two uh, Sunday school tent facilities came back in the morning on their day off, Friday's their day off, and they spent uh, until noon or a little bit later than that putting everything back and making sure everything was organized. Bible college students, we love you guys. Okay, you can sit down. You guys are awesome, all of you, and we're so thankful as a church for so many reasons that you're here, uh, but we're especially thankful. We would not be having services this morning, uh, storm or no storm, uh, without them because this place was, was torn apart. A couple of things that I want to make mention of. I know this was already announced. We're having a leadership conference coming up on the 16th and 17th. As many of you as can come should be there. Bill Mills, is, is, um, he's the founder of uh, Leadership uh, Resources International. He's been doing ministry for about 40 or 50 years. He happens to be here on his 50th wedding anniversary with his wife, and he called up and said, we love doing ministry even on our wedding anniversary. They're having their celebration on Oahu, but they want to come here, and they want to minister while they're here. Uh, we wouldn't be able to afford to bring them over here to do this conference. They're coming on their own dime. Uh, we're flying them over from Oahu and then helping with some of their accommodations here. But other than that, they are blessing our fellowship in this island with their leadership and training. So please sign up for that. Go after the service and uh, get yourself registered for that, and uh, you'll have a great time. One last thing. Um, Becky and I are kind of getting things out of our house. And uh, I've got so many books that I've read over the years, and I've got about 200 of them over here. They're all Bible study resource materials, they're commentaries, they're Bible study tools, uh, they're great Christian books on theology. They're all there for free. At the end of the day, I'm taking those down to Salvation Army and you're gonna have to go buy them down there. Don't do that. Go over there, Christmas gifts, friends that you wanna get, uh, white elephant gifts, whatever you want. You know, you can, you can take the books, uh, but feel free. It's a, it's a great resource over there. It's, it's uh, basically, a big chunk about maybe about half or a third by my, um, my library after all these years. Okay, let's go to the Word of God, the book of Colossians. Great section of scripture today. Uh, excited to share it with you. Also want to uh, just welcome those of you that are here for the first time, or I see a number of you coming back uh, that are vacationing and visiting again. We're so delighted to have you. We love all you guys and, uh, and delighted to walk with God together with you. Colossians chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. I'm teaching on the power of encouragement this morning. Colossians 2, verses 1 through 7. Paul speaking. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding in the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, 
rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Father, thank you for your word this morning. We are so grateful for so many things today, not the least of which is that we're able to have services and, and that this island and uh, the Hawaiian chain has been spared. And so God, we, we give you honor and glory today. We say thank you, Father, for your kindness to us. And we pray that you would uh, sharpen our hearts and our minds and our awareness to be able to receive this morning from your word. And Holy Spirit, please take my words and my preparation and use them to advance your purpose in the hearts of each man and woman and young person here today. We trust you. We love you. We appreciate your mentoring us and guiding us in the truth. And so do it again today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. By way of quick uh, review, for those of you that haven't been with us along our journey in Colossians so far, Paul is writing to a church that he's never visited. He didn't plant this church. Actually, one of his disciples planted this church whose name was Epaphras. Four years after the church was planted, Paul found himself in prison in Rome, a thousand miles away, and lo and behold, he was joined in prison by Epaphras, who was also arrested by Rome uh, for uh, his belief and his preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the city of Colossae. They were rounding up pastors across Europe and, and, uh, and that area of modern day Turkey. And so they were in prison together and Epaphras brings us stellar report of this budding and growing church in Colossae. And uh, they're filled with faith, they're filled with love for each other. Paul commends them for it and he just says, man, it's amazing the fruit that comes from your life and the testimony that I'm hearing from Epaphras and others about your progress in the faith. We spoke uh, at some length about the evidences of a true, truly born again person. And, uh, and it's so encouraging to realize that God actually transforms us and translates us into different people along the way in our walk with God. It's called sanctification. And Paul uh, enumerates a number of things about this church that he finds laudable and encouraging by virtue of the fact that they are now evidencing more and more of Jesus Christ. But there was a problem in the church that Epaphras brought Paul's attention to, and he told him, we have some false teachers that are rising up. And there was, it's called the Colossian heresy, and it was a hybrid of two false teachings. One was that we had, there were Jews that had come to Christ, a saving faith in Jesus, but they were still trying to hold on to the Old Testament law as a means of righteousness. So circumcision, the feasts and the festivals, the temple sacrificial system, and, uh, and everything that accompanied that Old Testament law, including the Ten Commandments and the 613 additional commandments, those for these Jews who received Christ were valuable, and they said, Jesus plus the past. And then there was a group of people that were pagan. They were Greek in origin, and they were coming to Christ, but in a similar fashion, they were saying, Jesus plus our false gods, or Jesus plus our false traditions. And Paul addresses this very critical issue of how to deal with false teachers. And so, uh, but as you've uh, discovered, as we've been going through the study together, Paul has a very interesting approach. You know, if it had been me, I would have gone point by point and dismantled each one of the uh, false teachings that were being presented in that church. I would have used apologetics to defend the faith and to explain why these teachings are not biblical and why people should avoid them. Paul doesn't do that. Instead, what Paul does is that he raises up and lifts up the real currency of a transformed group of people called the Colossian church. And he says, this is something that, that the false teachers can't replicate. Only God can do this. And by virtue of that, he was holding forth the true gospel of Jesus Christ as evidenced in the lives of the Colossians. It reminds me and may remind you of uh, when Moses was addre addressing Pharaoh and trying to get the people out of Egypt and the sorcerers were mimicking some of the miracles that Moses and Aaron were per performing at the command of God. And they were able to mimic some of them, but then they failed and they couldn't mimic all of them and they threw up their hands and said, this is none other than the finger of God. And there is a possibility and a capability of unbelievers or false teachers in some ways to mimic the transformed life of a Christian, but they can't keep up with the power of the Holy Spirit and the true work of the true gospel and the true word impacting people's lives. 
And that's what's happening here. And so Paul presents not the counterfeit or even a corrective to the counterfeit. He presents the real thing in the transformed lives of the believers. And then he exalts the supremacy of Christ. And now this morning, he's going to encourage the church even further. And we're going to find out more about this church. But we're going to find out a little bit about Paul too. Because the apostle Paul was one of the great leaders in Israel. He was one of the great leaders within the Sanhedrin, the 72 chosen leaders of all of Israel to lead the people of Israel. And he was climbing that corporate ladder within the religious system of Judaism. And he was just trouncing and running over the top of all of his peers. He was that dedicated, that devoted, that aggressive about his walk. And he was a teacher of the law, but he didn't have a heart for people. And he, had, he knew nothing about persuasive encouragement. He was a man that used the law as a sledgehammer. He was a man that knew how to manipulate people and a man that knew how to cause people to feel fear in his presence. He was not a man that engendered the thought of, wow, he's like a dad to me or like a mom to me, like he talks to the Thessalon uh, Thessalonican church. No, he was a man to be feared. But like the Colossian church who was transformed by the gospel, Paul was being transformed as well. And through the modeling and help of other Christians in his life, like Barnabas, who was called the son of encouragement, he began to learn God's way of true leadership. And it was to be encouraging. It was to be uplifting. It's kind of interesting. Um, they've done a lot of studies over the years uh, on business leadership models. And they've discovered something that's probably not very surprising. People who were encouraged in their work achieve the most. The second most uh, achievement-oriented group are those that are dominated by their leadership, and the least effective group are people who are neglected. So the people that, that do the best and perform the best and are at their best are people who are regularly encouraged. Second best are the people who are dominated and live in fear of their boss. And the third group are the people that have no real uh, help or support at all, and they actually achieve the le least. And uh, you may be familiar with the name Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart stores, one of the most successful enterprises on the planet uh, as, it goes, uh, as it relates to a, a store of that nature or even a company. This is what he said to his associates when he gathered all his associates globally and uh, from the United States into their corporate offices uh, for an annual meeting. He said to the leaders, he said, appreciate everything your associates do for the business. Nothing else can quite substitute for a few well-chosen, well-timed, sincere words of praise. They're absolutely free and worth a fortune. And now, of course, Walmart is too. And even though this is a business model that we're talking about, there is truth. They didn't, we're not stealing it from them. They've stole it from the Word of God. They've taken all these principles that are based on Scripture, and they're actually resourcing it. Not just Walmart, but people in the world. They're realizing, wow, we can't just be good leaders. We can't just dominate. We can't hold over them the pink slip and the fear of the job. We actually get much better results if we're actually encouraging. And I would say to you that that principle is true in a marriage. It's true with raising your children. It's true in the church. It's true in your community. It's true with your extended relationships. Encouragement goes a long way, and it's needed. So much so that in the book of Hebrews, twice, it tells us that we are to encourage each other every single day. In one place it says because the days are evil, and another place because it says it's the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. Is that we live in difficult times, and a word of encouragement goes a long way. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you right now, at the end of this service, after we're all done, I'm gonna ask each one of you to encourage somebody here today. So I want you to be kind of thinking about that as we go through this. I want you to find at least two or three people after the service, and I just want you to encourage them. It can be about things that you've noticed or things that you appreciate, things that you, uh, you value about them, character traits, things they've done for the church, things that they've done for you, uh, the example that they've set in their Christian life, whatever it might be. Uh, but we're going to actually practice that today, even though you're a church that, that does this frequently, uh, I want to actually have you have a chance to apply it. And it's life-changing, just a word of, of being encouraged kind of reminds me of the story of the, of the young boy that, uh, you know, just got a dart board for Christmas, and, and he tells his dad, okay, dad, come, uh, I want to I throw darts, I'll throw the darts, and you say wonderful. <laughs> and there's something about that, just having someone in your life who is kind of cheering you on, that is a real blessing. And we need to be doing that 
And Paul is going to do it in this text of Scripture today. So if you're following along in the notes, you can, uh, you can kind of go through this text with us. We do have this on our uh, U version as well. If you're dialed in on that, uh, you can pull that up online as well. The notes are there, as well as the filled in uh, portion of the notes. And so we begin by looking at the challenge of Paul's ministry. It says that he struggled. He was in a conflict. This word is agonizomai in the Greek. Uh, it's not hard to discern that agonizomai, the root word of that is to agonize. And this is the word that Paul uses to describe his prayer life for people, remember, that he's never met and has, doesn't even know. And he's not going to just to include the, the church of Colossae. He's going to mention another church that's 13 miles away west of Colossae, Laodicea, another church that has association with the church in Colossae. And Paul says, I'm agonizing. This is a word that's it's an athletic term. Um, you know, we just finished the Olympics. It's used in wrestling. It's used in, in uh, track and field. It's used of people that put out a significant amount of sweat and effort and pain and agony to achieve a goal. And this is the level of prayer that not only Paul was praying, but later in, in chapter 4, verse 12, he's going to encourage and highlight the pastor, their pastor, Epaphras, as being a man who agonizes in prayer for them, that they would stand in all the will of God, firm and secure in their faith, and mature, not lacking anything. And so Paul and Epaphras are praying up a storm for these two churches, and, uh, and he struggled with those that he said had not met him personally, verse 2, and he tells us why, that they might be encouraged, parakaleo. That's a word that's often used and associated with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Para means alongside of, kaleo, to call out, to call out someone to come alongside. And Paul is saying that he's encouraging the church. He's coming alongside the church and cheering them on in the work of God. And then he also says that he wants them to be united in love. I'm, I'm, I know I'm sharing a lot of words with you that are, are foreign to you, but they're significant and they're helpful in our understanding of the depth of this text and what the application is and what it means to us, because this word is sum bibazo, sum bibazo. And it means the joining of two separate pieces of material in an intricate way where they're just, it's just, it's perfection. And if you can think, we've got a number of carpenters and builders in our church. We've got a number of woodworkers and finished carpenters. We've got furniture makers in this church. And these guys are capable of building furniture that doesn't need nails or screws or anything. They just join these pieces of wood together in such an intricate way with, with dovetailing and with all kinds of, they got a whole bunch of names. I looked it up the other day. There are dozens and dozens of names for this kind of joint work that they do in creating beautiful pieces of furniture. The Chinese are experts at this. They actually love to build entire buildings with no glue, nothing, and, it, and, and they're solid. But each piece fits perfectly together. See, when I, if I build something, it's like, I, I, it's, you know, if, it's, if the line is pretty straight, it's good enough, and I get nails out and screws, and I just screw a nail, and then if it doesn't quite fit, I'm like a framer, man. I'm hitting the side of this thing. It's going to fit. It's going to fit. I mean, that's my definition of unity. But... That's not Paul's definition. He uses this very beautiful and perfect word of this fit that's just perfection. In fact, it's so perfect, we could call it art instead of furniture. And that's what Paul is praying for, for the church, that they would be united in this kind of love. Now, that doesn't always describe the church, but it should. And it's important for you to know that not just Paul is praying this, but Jesus prayed it in the upper room discourse when he was praying for the disciples. He prays, I, I'm praying for their unity. I'm praying, Father, that they would be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. And he goes on and talks about all this unity. And he says, may it be so. And he's praying for his bride. The Spirit of God in Romans chapter 8 is praying for the bride. Jesus is interceding for the bride. And each one of us Peter says, are like these fitted pieces of stone that have to be chipped away and carefully uh, sanded and prepared so that these pieces fit beautifully, intricately, solidly in a way that God's temple is built up for the glory and praise of Jesus Christ. And so what that really requires is that every one of us have to be honed. Every one of us have to be chipped away at. Every one of us need to be fit and prepared for the perfection of God's inclusion into the, into the temple of God, the body of Christ. 
So it's, a, it's an incredible gift that God has given us to do that. But it means that all of us have to be humble. All of us have to be broken. All of us have to be willing to say whatever it takes to, to, to not create. We're not after creating unity. What we're after is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ creates unity. He changes us and transforms us. So unity is actually easy. You want to know how we find ourselves unified? It's not by agreeing to disagree on everything. That's, that's phony. Real unity comes from men and women who are persuaded by this text, who interpret it correctly and apply it properly. And the result is, lo and behold, we're all working from the same manual. It's like, wow, we're on the same team. We've got the same directives. We've got the same God, the same spirit, the same clarity of how to function and how to operate in life. God gives all this to us. And then, lo and behold, we look around and it's like we're pieces of a puzzle. And it's like, wow, that fits and that fits. And the picture gets clearer. You, you guys remember when you were young and you got your first puzzle and you got frustrated because you couldn't find the right pieces and you started pounding and jamming pieces. Anybody ever do that? And, and I remember that. And my, I think it was my sister said, you know, they, they, they were like, that, you're, you're blowing this. You're, you, there's a right piece for the spot. You can't force pieces in. If you're forcing it in, you won't get the puzzle correct. So if you find a piece that doesn't fit, be patient and look for the right piece. And, and that's the way that God works. He's patiently fitting us and preparing us and moving us, even in different locations and locales, uh, on different places in the globe, he's fitting us and moving us. And this is why it's so important and why, honestly, it's kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's really an unfortunate argument that people make that I don't need the church and I'm not important in the church and the church is important to me. It's me and Jesus and I'm out surfing and that's my fellowship. It's such a terrible misunderstanding of God's intention to fit us together. And honestly, it's a cop-out because it's a whole lot easier to live a dysfunctional, semi, you know, godly, slightly carnal life out there because you don't have to fit with anybody. You can be on your own and, and, and live that kind of a life and it only really affects you or so you might think. But the reality is it affects the body of Christ because God's purpose is for all of us to fit together and be joined together in this beautiful way. What, what's it look like? Okay, let me, let me give you just, I'm going to give you nine things that came to my mind of what unity looks like in the life of a believer. Number one, we treasure each other and put tens on each other's heads. That's just the way of the life of the kingdom is that we don't look at each other and find what's wrong. We're looking at each other and saying, wow, what a beautiful creation of God, loved by God, in the image of God, cared for by God, treasured by God. Secondly, we spotlight gifts and abilities rather than the faults and failures of people around us. Thirdly, we rally around each other in times of sadness or loss or defeat. Fourth, we allow people to have bad days. We just know what's going to happen. It happens to us. We make room for that. We don't condone it. We're not saying sin is okay, but we're saying, man, we all have rough days. We give each other room and space when that happens. Five, we're quick to forgive and we're quick to repent. We act in kindness toward each other. We defend each other and believe the best about each other. We encourage one another and pray for one another, and we conduct ourselves above all in keeping with the standard of God's word because we know that when we do, we'll be acting out of the heart of Christ. And when we do that, we'll be acting in unity. And when we do that, we're bringing glory to God. I want to encourage you. These are all things that really represent this church. These are all things that you guys are doing these are things that God is evidencing in you. It's not you doing it. It's not you working at it. It's not you having this list. It's you being empowered and living under the control of the Spirit of God and in obedience to Christ according to the Word. And the result is, is that we have a very peaceful church filled with men and women that love God and love others and are making disciples. And it's just a, it's a, it's you, the fingerprints of God are on the fellowship and on any fellowship that pursues Christ with a whole and sincere heart. Well, why did Paul pray this? Well, he, he prayed all these things and encouraged them because in verse two, the last part, he says, I want you to have the full riches of complete understanding. Now, here's another word in the Greek. The other one was sumbabidzo, which is this fitting together of physical elements, the body of Christ. And now he says, I want you to have complete understanding, sunesis. And that's the fitting together of thoughts and concepts and spiritual truth in our minds. One is, the first one is us fitting together as, as a body. The second is our minds putting the pieces together of doctrine, of sound doctrine from the Word of God. 
this has got to, this happens to all of us, and all of you can understand this. When we first got saved, we had a certain uh, small understanding of doctrine. We didn't understand everything. In fact, we understood very little, but what we did understand, the pieces started to fall into place and it started to make sense. You remember that? And then as you moved on in your walk with God, you were confused about different things about the Bible and how it fit together and the stories and why God operated in some ways in the New Testament or Old Testament in different ways. And, 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 you, and then you started getting some teaching and reading and understanding and you started putting the pieces together and you go, wow, the Old Testament is all foreshadowing the ministry of Jesus Christ and you started to understand all that. That's sunesis. When the pieces start to fall into place, you're experiencing sunesis. It's a spiritual understanding. How do we get that understanding? Well, First John tells us that it comes from the teachings of Christ. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, sunesis, so that we may know him who is true. But it also comes from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand, sunesis, what God has freely given us. And so, you see, God is putting our lives back together. He's putting the church together. He's, he's putting the world back together, not in this dimension, but he's preparing it for the next dimension where he will finally put it all together and every piece will be completed and every piece in its proper place. And he says, because of this and this complete understanding, I want you to know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's so much I could say about this, but I want to summarize it briefly and say that as we read this, it just seems like he's kind of covering another topic. But for the Colossians and those that were teaching doctrine that was otherwise, Paul is addressing the false teaching of this super knowledge, of this elevated knowledge that the um, pagans were claiming and also the Jews were claiming is that there is more than just Jesus that's necessary. There's more to the gospel. Yes, the gospel. Yes, the cross. Yes, repentance. But there is an ascended knowledge that awaits those who follow our particular strain of this perverted teaching of the gospel. And so Paul actually uses this to say, you want hidden knowledge, church? You want to be a part of this elite group of Gnostics Gnosis, being knowledgeable about things that are beyond the sphere of human understanding and beyond the text of scripture. He says you're looking in all the wrong places because you want to know who is the, the repository of all of that knowledge. It's God in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the treasure and storehouse of everything that we need to know about God and how to walk with him. The Colossians were claiming a deeper secret knowledge about spiritual things, and Paul blows that out of the water, dismisses it by saying that if you want true knowledge, if you want true wisdom, you don't have to go any farther than Jesus Christ. And this, this treasure of, of mystery that he's talking about is no longer a mystery because Jesus Christ is now the revelation, the apocalypsis of all that God had foreshadowed in the Old Testament that made it a mystery who the Messiah would be, how he would come, uh, how he would redeem mankind. All these things were, were vague. We knew he was the Messiah. We knew he would deliver. We knew the promises. We knew specifics about his life and his death and his resurrection, but it was all sh shadowed for us. It was unclear. But when Christ came, what was once dark now became light. What was once in his shadows is now brilliant in, in its glory. And so Paul says that this mystery that you're after has already been revealed, and it's revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. So what I love about this as a Christian is that, uh, you know, along the way, my personal experience as a Christian was that I had a number of people say, Bob, I'm so happy you're so excited about Jesus. I'm so happy you're reading your Bible. And then the big but would come. But have you been filled with the Spirit? But do you speak in tongues? And but have you, have you entered into this particular way of reading the Bible uh, with an overlay of this concept of the, a bigger picture that man has actually created in our, our understanding of theology? And I would get stumbled up by those things, and maybe some of you can relate to that. And I would try to wander around, and I think, well, what am I missing? I got the Bible in front of me. I know Jesus is in me. I know the Bible says the Spirit of God indwells a Christian when they, be, when they become saved, so I, I know he's in me. 
am I missing something greater? Am I missing something that's out there that, that's elusive to me that I need to go to some uh, prophet to hear? Uh, do I need to go to some revival? Is it in, some, in the tapes of some great teacher that this deeper knowledge exists? And the answer categorically is no. It's not. The answer is everything that's revealed in scripture. Nothing more and nothing less. Does that mean that I can't learn from other people? Of course not, it doesn't mean that. I can learn from all kinds of people as long as they're teaching me the word of God. As long as they're pointing to things that are actually modeled by Jesus, taught by Jesus, experienced by the New Testament church, and instructed for the New Testament church to participate in. Those are all good litmus tests for what I should be doing. And so when someone comes to me now, or even earlier, later in my Christian life, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not persuaded by that because the things you're asking me to do or inviting me into aren't found in the Bible. Jesus didn't encourage it. The disciples didn't practice it. It's not directed for the church to be a part of. Therefore, I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to trust that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are already revealed to us and found here in Christ. And, and the beautiful part about that is accessibility. <laughs> because isn't that, what, isn't that what this is really all about? Jesus constantly saying, you have access, you have access, you have access. And others saying, oh, no, you don't. Not if you don't do it our way. Not if you don't get our access. Not if we don't teach you access. And that's where the problem was. And so Paul, in this very simple phrase, demolishes the false teachers and says, they already have access, and it's in the person of Christ. And I would say to you, church, you have access in the person of Jesus. You don't need to go anywhere else. All these treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in the person of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm praying that no one would deceive you, verse 4. This, uh, the same word is actually used in the Septuagint in chapter 29 of the Bible. That story is about uh, Laban giving Jacob deceptively Leah instead of Rebecca. I don't have time to explain the whole story, but those of you that know it will, will recall that uh, it was the wedding day for Jacob and Rachel, and he thought he was going to be married to the love of his life, and instead he gets her, his sister, the, uh, Rebecca's sister, and in the dark, he, he doesn't discern that this is his, uh, uh, sis, the, the sister instead of his uh, treasured wife, Rachel. And that word that's used there is the same word that's used here of deceiving the Colossians. And what it means, it's like one of Satan's simplest tricks is to, is to deceive Christians by laying a slightly twisted and perversion of the truth next to the truth. So that we think that that's the truth and we gravitate toward it unknowingly. And so Paul says, I don't want you to be deceived. I don't want you to be like, like Jacob, thinking you're getting Rachel, and you end up with Leah. And so Paul is saying that he doesn't want the church deceived about these things, and he says by fine-sounding arguments. And again, this word is only used once in the entire New Testament, uh, the fine-sounding arguments. It's used a lot in Paul's day by attorneys and lawyers. It was a, it was a judicial term. And it was used by attorneys for the purpose of persuading the judge and the jury to an unjust verdict. That's the purpose. That's what this word means. So it's the technique and the ability of a, an educated person using the law, not for the purpose of justice, but for the purpose of uh, the benefit of the person who's actually the criminal. And using that law against the system to create an avenue whereby injustice actually takes place. And Paul says that I don't want you to be deceived in that same manner. And so he says he's praying for them and uh, wanting them to do well in their walk with God. Well, he goes on in verse 5 and he begins to encourage them. And he says, you know, even though I'm absent from, from your presence, your physical, my body is not with you. My spirit is with you. I'm with you heart and soul. Can you imagine getting a letter like this from the Apostle Paul? He's not there. The guy doesn't know you. And he starts to describe how he agonizes in prayer for you. And all these things that he's been thinking about you and the concern, but also the elevating of you, the encouragement he's just lavishing on you. And he's saying, you know, even though I can't be there, even though I've met, not met you, even though I don't know your names, I want you to know I'm with you heart and soul. My spirit is with you. And he says, I delight to see how orderly they are. Now, again, we get more information about the, the impact, the effect of the truly born again life. Is now Paul, in a secondary way, that's not his intent. What he's doing is encouraging the church, but we're gonna extrapolate from that information 
more information about what a true Christian looks like and what a true church looks like. They are orderly in their behavior and their conduct. It's a military term uh, that uh, Paul is likening the fellowship to of well-disciplined soldiers. They, they're well-governed. They have a commander-in-chief. That commander-in-chief is, is giving them instruction and training them, and the result is, is you've got this ragtag group of people that suddenly become very ordered, and they become a, a force to be reckoned with. And Paul says, you have become that force to be reckoned with. Now, keep in mind, this church is only four years old, but these people have grown. They've matured. They're developing rapidly because they are really being genuinely transformed by the power of God and the Word of God. I, I, um, I've been amazed at how quickly people can change, and maybe you have too. I've seen some Christians, they never change. You know, they just seem to be kind of almost in a time warp. They're, they're there, they're coming, they're participating at some level, but you don't really see the character development. You don't see really a lot of victory in their life. You don't see the development of this transformation. And it's not because they're not trying hard, it's because there's a lack of connection. Because it's the connection that makes the changes. It's Jesus who makes the changes. So it's not necessarily the fault of the person in the sense that they're not trying hard enough, but I would say that, that there is a, a, a negligence in their spiritual life that's now being evident in, in the fact that they're not transforming. But Paul sees this transformation and he says, wow, I can't believe it. You're so orderly even in your worship in the things that you do. Now, I want to say that, you know, how do we become orderly like that? Well, it's much in the same way that the tongue and groove and the joining of pieces of wood and, and a piece of art or furniture takes place is that there's a part that each of us play individually. When we're prepared individually, then everything fits together. I don't have to be worried about trying to make it all fit. I have to be concerned about being the proper piece that God has called me to be. And if we all are concerned with the proper piece that God has called us to be, then lo and behold, he fits us together, as the scriptures say. So what can we do? Well, be, just keep being consistent in the Word of God. Keep learning and keep growing in your knowledge of God and the love of God and the doctrine of God because as you do, you become better fit and sunesis takes place. The pieces of the puzzle in your own understanding come together. You're, you're more prepared to be a part of this you know, force to be reckoned with that God is raising up in our day in the church. Develop a relationship with God with prayer. Give yourself to service in the body of Christ. You'll never be fit for the kingdom of God in the sense of, of being properly fitted together if we're not functioning as the church, which again is why it's so important that we're all a part of the church and actually using our gifts in the church because it's through that process that God fits us and helps us to know where our place is and how we can advance the kingdom of God. Well, he delighted in, in addition to how firm their faith in Christ was. He says, you guys started with faith and you just keep holding on to faith. You're not going to faith plus something else or faith plus you know, some new doctrine or, or some new fangled teaching, but they're holding on to faith in Christ. And their faith, of course, is encouraged by the word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he goes on in, in uh, verse six and he begins to continue to encourage them. Keep going on in your faith. And he says, continue to live in Christ. And the actual word is peripateo, which means to walk. He says, just keep taking steps. And again, I love this encouragement. You know, uh, Paul doesn't say, man, you guys need to start, you know, doing some leapfrogging here. You're behind in your walk with God. He doesn't say that. He says, you guys just keep moving forward. Keep stepping forward. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. That is how a Christian grows. That's how a movement takes place. I, you know, I was, um, I was reading the paper this morning and uh, I forgot the gentleman's name. They're making the large canoe uh, and they just finished it. Uh, his name is Chun, the last name. He's, a, he's an artisan. Anybody remember his first name? Yeah. Dennis Chun. Do you know that he's been building that boat for 20 years on Kauai? It's a, it's a double-hulled outrigger canoe that they're going to sail around the world, much like the Hokulea. Dennis has been on uh, the Hokulea and, and been the navigator and the, the uh, pilot of that boat on many occasions. He's, he's got a world of experience and uh, they're actually going to christen that boat and launch it down at Nawili Willy, I think at Kalapaki Bay on uh, the 11th of September. I think that's going to be quite a celebration down there. But um, uh, Dennis was talking about that and he's saying, you know, I mean, I, he said the, the biggest lesson he's learned in this whole thing is perseverance. I mean, when was the last time any of us, you know, worked on something for 20 years of that nature? 
there are very few things that any of us have had to work on and not give up on for 20 years. And I would say that the Christian life is similar to that. It's one step at a time. It's like there's a lot of naysayers that Dennis had to face and people that said it'll never happen and what a silly idea and what a waste of money, what a waste of your life. And uh, Dennis just kept plugging along. And, and now this, this boat's done. He didn't build it himself, but it was a very small group of people. People from the mainland, people from, the, from Tahiti and Samoa, people from Hawaii, people from Kauai. And something that thought, people thought would never be completed was done. It's the same way the boat, the Noah's Ark was built. It's the same way anything of value is built. And so I want to suggest to you that Paul says, you know, just keep taking steps. Don't, don't be distressed about where you are or even your circumstances. Just keep taking steps forward. Keep trusting the Lord. God is going to bless that, and he does. And so he encouraged them to live in Christ, and he uses, he uses three participles, there's actually four, that are all under the heading of walking in Christ. So he said, keep walking in Christ. That's the main part of, that's the main verb. Keep walking one step at a time toward Christ. And then he says, this is what it looks like. These are the four things that, that, that are part of what it looks like to walk in Christ a step at a time. And the first three, we don't even do. It's in the active, um, um, I want to say submissive, it's subjunctive. It's not that. I don't remember what it is. It's, uh, it's fleeing me, and I don't think I have it in my notes because I, I normally know that. Uh, it, it'll probably come to me. Uh, passive, there it is. So it's in the passive voice. Active meaning it's an ongoing, continual thing that's taking place. Passive mean you're not doing it. You're passive. You're just there, and it's happening to you. What's happening to you as you walk a day at a time in Christ? He says you'll be rooted in him. Your roots are going to go down. A plant doesn't have to stress or think about the roots going down. It just happens when you put them in the right environment. And God puts us in the right environment when we're simply walking with him. So just walk with him. Your roots will go down, and you'll have strength. And then you'll be built up in him, which is to construct. It's oikodomeo, and it means everything above the ground, not the foundation, but everything above the ground that you can see begins to surface. And so on a plant, the leaves shoot out, the limbs come out, and the fruit starts to be uh, hanging from the, from the edges of the limbs. And so this is all, again, what God is doing as we simply walk with him. And the third thing is that you'll be strengthened in the, in the faith as you were taught. Again, God will strengthen you in your faith. God will build you up. God will create it. And all we have to do is simply fall in love with God. Take it a step at a time. Keep moving forward. Keep letting the edges of your life be, be uh, honed in such a way that you're fitting the puzzle pieces of God's eternal work. Just be available. Be willing. The pressure is off of the Christian. The pressure is off. The work is God's. The word of God, the spirit of God, all these things enter into our minds as we simply allow our life to be influenced by these by these factors, and when we allow our lives to be influenced by these things and we say yes to God, lo and behold, we mature, we grow, we are strengthened, our roots go down, our fruit comes out, and we're built up and we become a force to be reckoned with within the body of Christ because we're all finding our proper place. And so what is our part? It's the last participle. He says, as a result of all of this, be thankful. And that's in the present indicative, which means that's our responsibility. We're to be doing this all the time. So you want to know what our part is? Just give ourselves to God, love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love others. And then the other part is to simply be thankful. God says, just, you know, rip it up. You talk about Paul being encouraging. You know, I know this is going to sound a little strange, but when did, when's the last time you encouraged God? Does God need encouragement? No. He's independent of us in that sense. Is God blessed by encouragement? Absolutely. Is God going to quit if you don't say thank you? No. But he is so blessed. You want to know what the Old Testament leaders did? You know what their job was? It was to minister to the Lord. It was to minister to the Lord. So the priests and the Levites, they ministered to the Lord day and night. They ministered to him. They blessed him. They sang to him. They exalted him. They glorified him and they praised him. And God loves that. Does he, is he going to stop if we don't? No, he's going to keep moving forward with those that will. But what a privilege that we have to be a source of encouragement. You actually have something that God wants. He wants something from you. He wants your love and your devotion, and he deserves it. He wants your praise and your adoration. He wants your affection. He's jealous for you. 
What a blessing. Can you imagine that God wants us that bad? I can't even believe God wants me at all, much less with the kind of terms that the scriptures talk about. God loves the church. He loves his bride. And he's coming back for us soon. In the meantime, Paul went from a man that knew very little about what it was to be an encouragement to other people around him, and instead he used the hammer of the law, the hammer of guilt, the hammer of manipulation. Did he produce some things? Yeah, you you get some things done that way. But it's not the highest form of leadership. The highest form of leadership is encouragement. The highest form of leadership is is to build others up and strengthen others. The highest form of leadership is is to lift others past you and beyond you. And that's a calling that every Christian man and woman has. And it's also the mark of a truly born again Christian. It's so easy to fall into the trap of being critical and and measuring people and finding them deficient, finding them in uh, in, uh, a place of inadequacy, not up to par, not, not to your liking. And it's not hard to find that because the truth is, is that it's all true. None of us are, none of us are what we will be. But for now, we have this enormous privilege of putting tens on each other's heads because God does. We have this enormous privilege of loving each other because God does. We have this enormous privilege of working together because it's God's will for us to be in unity, fitted together like not just a a doghouse or even a really nice piece of furniture, but like a piece of art, like a poem, something that's just, you say, wow, how could this be? That's the, that's the realm of God's skill. Jesus came. He was a carpenter. He knows a little bit about making good furniture. And he knows a lot about raising up men and women to be the temple of God in our day and to be the bride of Christ. And every single one of you is important. There is not one here or one that calls on the name of Christ that doesn't matter. And everyone is loved by God, and we're a team. And we walk together, we serve together, we love together, we advance the kingdom of God together, and we worship together. And we'll find our our best days ahead of us as we continue in that line, in that heart of completely allowing God to reign supreme over our hearts. I'm not the shepherd of this church. I'm an under-shepherd. The chief shepherd is Jesus Christ, and he's doing a fantastic job. I'm so glad he's in charge, and I'm so glad that we're his flock, and I'm so glad that he loves us so much, that he's working so diligently, moment by moment, day by day, in a variety of ways to bring about the perfection in your life individually, but the perfection of the church at large. We have a great thing ahead of us, and we're in an awesome time. Make the most of it, worship God, and live a life of thanksgiving. Father, we thank you for this time this morning in your word, and what a blessing, God, uh, to dig in uh, and just kind of be scratching the surface of some of these things and yet finding so many beautiful principles for our lives and uh, and for interpreting uh, this letter that was written to a group of people. Of course, Paul never met, we never met, but one day we will. These saints, these believers, these lovers of God, along with the Uh, uh, with the millions, tens of millions, billions, I don't know how many people are going to be in the kingdom, but when we get there, what a a great time we're going to have. Lord, I'm looking forward to it. We delight in you now. I delight in the church, God. I thank you for the church. I know sometimes people sometimes can be grumbly about uh, circumstances or, or events or people or sometimes, and I don't hear it in our church very much at all, but I know sometimes people are like that. And I'm just thinking, wow, I'm I'm not going to talk down the bride ever because this is what you count precious. And what I see in the bride is beauty. What I see in the bride is the likeness of Jesus. What I see in the bride is transformation. What I see in the bride is the glory of God. What I see in the bride is a reflection of the heart of the kingdom and the heart of their Savior. And so God, keep working in us. Keep working through us. And keep bringing glory to your name as a result of the precious formation and the precious transformation and the precious uh, commodity that the bride of Christ represents in your heart, the love of your life. And God, we love you back. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.